ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. We will start. Once again, we have the town manager, um, Chen Zimi and Anthony Zepini with us. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, this is the plan for tonight. We're going to go through the warrant pretty much, but not completely in order, in numerical order. I'm going to save some that might be more, uh, require more discussion towards the end. When we get through the warrant, um, then I'll open it up to any additional questions you'd like to ask. So, um, so if you can just focus on the warrant article we're doing and, and know that at the end, um, you can open it up for additional questions. So we're going to finish the whole thing and then vote? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let's start. Um, and these, uh, you may remember a few weeks ago, we went through the warrant and we identified articles we wanted to have the town manager and discuss with us. So uh, based on that, this is, this is the list. So we'll start with article seven and 54 because they are related. And that is the uh, private way betterments. So, sure. So starting with article seven, uh, those were revisions to the betterment bylaw that uh, the town management office proposed uh, as a result of discussions with the office of the select board, as well as uh, some abutters on private ways who were contemplating seeking changes to the betterment bylaw on their own through a citizen petition. But they were things that we agreed as staff needed to be addressed. Uh, the, the major change was how uh, petitions for a group of private ways within a larger association would be handled. So we had had a situation, and we've had other situations in the past with perhaps two or three streets will seek a petition for a betterment that the way our bylaw is currently constructed would require those two or three streets to actually seek a vote and signature from every single abutter in the entire association. So that could be 300 plus households if you're in some of our larger associations, when in fact those folks wouldn't even be impacted by the betterment. And that was just a matter of how our bylaw was written and how we had to enforce the policy. That became basically far too much legwork for those abutters on those streets to undertake. And it served as a deterrent uh, from them undertaking their betterment. So we propose to revise that language, allowing groups of private ways to pursue betterments, having the petition only be voted upon by the actual abutters who are going to pay for uh, those betterments. The other main change I saw, and maybe what was of interest to the finance committee, uh, was changing the required deposit before a project could proceed. Uh, as currently written, our bylaw requires the town to receive a one-third deposit. Uh, based on the projects that we have undertaken since 2020, I observed that our upfront collection rate had in every single instance exceeded two thirds. Uh, and based on that information, I proposed a bylaw change that would then require that two third uh, deposit at a hearing with the select board. They were not willing uh, to move forward with a two third deposit and instead voted on a 50% deposit requirement. And essentially why uh, that is important is it helps generate cash flow for the program. So the way we've been operating since uh, the account was last seeded in 2022 was we bring a project in, it gets approved. Uh, as, one, as soon as we have the one-third deposit, we're good to go. Project proceeds, it gets paid, inspected, closed out. As you can imagine, some of those projects, the whole process can take six months, nine months, and then we ultimately end up collecting most of the money at the end because folks don't want to be assessed over the course of five years 
while paying interest. Unless, of course, they know they're not going to be living in the home for five years or they simply don't have the money up front. But we're seeing that was fewer and fewer households. But since we weren't seeing the cash flow until the end of the project, the next project in the pipeline was unable to proceed. So in, until we knew we had enough to, to pay the bill for the next petition that was approved, we were not allowing that project to proceed unless they were willing to pay more than the one third deposit. So we required one street to pay 100% down because we were out of money and they did. And the next project that came forward, we said, well, we'll let you proceed, but I'm, you're going to need to collect 72% upfront. And they collected 80 and now they're in the pipeline to proceed. So based on our experience with how we had been operating, they proposed a change to try to guarantee and put us in a position to better plan projects. So multiple projects could uh, proceed simultaneously, you know, perhaps upwards of four in a season versus two because when we were not allowed to green light a project at the beginning of the season and had to wait, they will often get deferred to the next year, which causes a higher cost for the residents. So uh, with that chain, proposed change in the deposit, I also proposed acknowledging that that could present a hardship that if a project was going to be borrowed for, there's gonna be some sort of instrument of debt issued that in fact the deposit wouldn't be required because we have a way to separately account for uh, any assessments that come in over time to go straight towards paying down the debt or the debt service associated with that borrowing. But under our current protocol, we're not able to establish an enterprise fund for this mechanism. So those assessed collections over the course of five years, right, they get assessed, they get collected, uh, they're not budgeted as revenue. They're just pro close to free cash annually. So we do get the money back, but our collection mechanism just caused us to defer a lot of projects. So uh, that was the changes for Article 7. Uh, related is Article 54 is the need to re-see uh, the private way revolving fund, uh, which we had proposed at $100,000, which was the amount of funding that had been uh, appropriated by town meeting in fiscal year 22. We're now down to uh, approximately $22,000 uh, balance in our account. So as of July 1, we would, with this money, bring the balance back up to 122000 Unfortunately, that, that would have been ample money or just enough money to proceed with all four projects. We believe we had the better, we had on the docket for betterments in 2024. Uh, but at the 50% guaranteed funding rate, we know that we could at least proceed with three of the projects slated uh, in fiscal year 24. So that was the genesis of the, the $100,000 uh, ask. Before that, we hadn't seeded the private way account. Town meeting had voted to authorize $300,000 in 2006. We borrowed hundred thousand dollars in 2006 and did not finish spending that until 2016. So what we're seeing, what we've seen over the past four years is more private way projects because now they're either it, they're, they've reached enough years where they've just totally failed because they were built in, you know, the eighties, late seventies, early eighties. Uh, there's been enough turnover on those streets of people wanting to uh, support the betterment. And frankly, paving projects have just gotten significantly more expensive over the past handful of years. So, you know, when we only used to see one a year or one every other year, there was never much of an issue with cash flow. But now we'll see, you know, it took us only less than two years to uh, burn through the $100,000 that we appropriated uh, in 2022. And that's why it's back for this body again this year. And I think, you know, based on our experience, it's likely something that will appear, uh, at least from what I'm seeing, each year until, you know, a number of streets are, uh, are paved over. And you provided us with a list of what the potential projects will be for the private ways, right? Yep, that either have petitioned or 
we expect will be petitioning because they've picked up packets and we've started the process of providing estimates. And Tara just sent that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we all had that. Yep. All right, any questions on Article 7 or 54? Token. <clears throat> yeah, um, it would be an example of an association as opposed to just a single street. Uh, Kelvin Manor. Kelvin Manor. Uh, Tower Heights, which is massive. But, you know, those two actually encompass most of our private ways. Yes. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I just want clarification. So, so on Article 7, you said that the standard practice has been to find about two-thirds, but we're running out of money because we don't have that. So I'm wondering, you know, if that's, if, if you, if, if the Secretary had voted for two-thirds, which is what you said you wanted, it sounds like that was just clarifying the standard practice. So we'd be net left no better off or worse. We would be putting our residents in a better position to proceed on the timeline they want to proceed. Right. We're, we wouldn't be getting more dollars. Right. That's we're the just, question. We're right. guaranteed to get more dollars so because before you know something a can proceed. Okay. Okay. Right and now then, we only make them pay us one third to proceed. And we, we collect most of the money. But it could be nine months or a year later. But you can't book the project because you don't know. We don't have sure. it on our books yet. Got it. Okay, I get that. Okay. Um, and then the one hundred thousand that we put in last year and we put in this year, um, is that to offset some of the costs because it's just more expensive than the residents are paying? Or it's that there? that money is what the town puts forward for the folks who don't pay. So oh, if say okay. got it. They say they come up with 70 or 80 percent down. Yeah, yeah. We're funding the rest and then it gets assessed on their real estate taxes. So basically, we're covering funding. the float. Of, yeah. like, right. Okay. So that's a covered float. Okay. So in theory, we get that back eventually, but just yeah. not very quickly. Okay. Over the course of five years. Great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Charlie. I think I just got my question answered. We, we, get, we get all the money back eventually. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just a cash flow thing. Any other questions, Sophie? Uh, for the private, are there private ways that are in such shape that you force them to, to do the betterment? I can't think of an example where we forced a betterment now. Okay. Uh, Alan, Alan and Tilly. When they, uh, when they pay the money through their betterment assessments, does that go back into that fund or is it go to the general fund? It has to go to the general fund. Okay, so in effect, that's what we're we're getting all the money back, like Charlie said. It's just it's going to different yeah, places. Over five years. Yeah. Just closes to free cash each year. So far? Yeah. yeah. If National Grid, say, tears up the street for maids as a private way, who repays that? Is that something that they are on the hook to do? They would be, I know, if it was a public way. National Grid has trench maintenance responsibilities no matter what they dig up. Okay. So they, well, they have to patch it, but they don't necessarily have to do Restore. Restore. They don't have to redo the whole. They, they don't have to go curb to curb. No, it's a. <laughs> um, Mike Bowen. Yeah, um, Jim, as a large purchaser of painting services, does the town get a preferential rate? Oh, uh, we are not actually the contracting authority on a private way, so the residents seek their own quotes from private contractors. Uh, so, you know, we, we are not going to put services involved. And frankly, because you're a private purchaser, you're not paying prevailing wage and, and a number of things that we would pay as a government entity. So you actually wouldn't want us doing the purchasing on your behalf. But the town does come back and make sure the work is done to standard. Yep, we help write the spec through our engineering division and we inspect afterwards before the invoice gets paid. Sophie, did you have your hand up? Uh, George. Yeah, um, so these two articles, these are changes to the revolving fund um, and just what the requirements are. But um, I know that towns, will op towns and cities will often make minor repairs. I think <clears> it's up to $1,500. Um, that doesn't these bylaws, the changes to the bylaws and how we use the revolving fund, that doesn't affect those minor changes, does it? 
No, we don't have a minor repair threshold value codified in our bylaw. Okay, I think somewhere, and of course I can't remember where it is right now, but I think somewhere in mass general law, there's some provisions somewhere where you can make essentially minor repairs. So I was just curious if the revolving fund had ever been used in that way for smaller repairs, but I'm, this is really more of, this is more uh, regarding what the betterments are. This is the betterment. If it, you're correct that we do, if it gets approved, recommended by the Department of Public Works, the town manager, we could put forth before the select board the ability to go patch some potholes or something. And then we would have to determine whether or not we want to assess those repair costs onto the household or not. Thank you. Any other questions on 7454? All right, moving on. The next one is Article 35, paper access. And you sent us numbers for that. Yeah, so turn it over to Alex, but that, that is a budget that is provided for by ACMI directly. And I know we we received that today, though a little bit late. So apologies that folks may not have had a chance to see it yet, but I think it's getting circulated now. Yeah. So yeah, so how the PEG Act, if the PEG is for the public educational governmental TV, uh, ACMI is, you know, our great uh, public access TV station in town. Um, they receive 5% of all subscribers within town. They pay a fee that goes, uh, used to go directly to ACMI. Now we act as a pastor. Um, and so the total revenue anticipated in FY25 um, broken down into four categories. The vast majority of that comes from cable subscribers. Um, some are north of seven hundred thousand dollars. So the total is uh, anticipated to be seven hundred and fifty-six thousand um, dollars. A certain portion of that must be spent on capital, so that's lined out in their proposed budget. Um, they are they proposed a budget that has a bit of a shortfall in it, of about sixty thousand um, dollars, and uh, without a way to make up that deficit. They um, anticipate uh, potentially needing to reduce staff or um, you know, sort of curtail services. So, um, like we said, this is sort of a, a pass through to us. Um, so that's just a bit. The, the crux of the declining revenue on the cable side is fully attributed to cord cutting. So when folks no longer have sort of a, a hard line cable and they switch to streaming. Uh, those revenues are no longer collected for uh, local cable access. So that's what has resulted in a uh, declining stream over the past few years. And you know, I'm guessing the outlook probably isn't getting any better. But there, I know there are some, there's some legislation and fixes being sought. The state hasn't even beyond that to try to uh, perhaps cap recapture some of that revenue from uh, streamers or other subscription services. Questions? So I'm sorry, how are they going to make up for the deficit for next year? So in, in their note, and again, we, we just got this a little while before the meeting, it says, unless this deficit is made up, ACMI will need to reduce staff and curtail services to the town. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm not sure if there's Precedent before for their having, you know, presented a budget that was not balanced, but, you know, as I read the language of the warrant article, I think really what, what we're doing is all we can do is appropriate the monies that we anticipate to receive from RCN, Comcast, and Verizon, and that's it's appropriated via pass-through each quarter. But I, I'm not sure we can go beyond uh, that. We, we didn't program any additional uh, funds into the budget for uh, fiscal year 25. Other questions? John. Um, you know what the, the capital revenue is? I noticed that this operating revenue of 632,000 capital. It's just a it's a percentage of their overall revenue, um, okay. and it must be spent 
dollar for dollar of capital items within it. within their operation. So it's all coming from subscribers, but they put it's yeah, it's the same pot of money yeah. and it, it just it's dedicated to capital. Got so it. RCN cuts two checks every quarter, Verizon cuts two checks because those are formulaically calculated so that the certain amount goes to operating, a certain amount goes to capital. So so by how many by voting on this is is Appropriating and transferring seven fifty six correct, or is it less than that? Oh, it's actually less than that. It's thirty two thousand more than that, right? Because no. the, the bottom the bottom two lines in their proposed budget are not town funds. Like oh, the total, total there's sure. right. There should be a line for their fidelity bank account, which they're drawing upon, and then their other yeah. donations. But the the crux of our appropriation is the money we receive as a pass through, which is the operating and capital lines. Seven hundred and seventeen thousand oh zero two nine dollars. I mean, just a quick question. Do you know where their fidelity account came from? Was it private fundraising? Was it that some years they they took in more revenue than they needed and they put in there. Do you know the history of it? I don't know for sure. Okay. I do know they do some fundraising, but I'm guessing there could be other sources. Yeah, okay, just curious. Um, Michael and Charlie. It's the total of accumulated savings from about six years to 20 years ago. It's invested in a number of um, Fidelity mutual funds that are professionally managed. Um, uh, it's been an endowment account for the seven years that I've been treasurer, and it's throwing off revenue, of course, and which until recently we were reinvesting every year, but we can't do that and keep the lights on. Got it. Okay. Charlie? Am I correct in assuming there's no other town funds going into the ACMI uh, operation? There is no uh, town revenues other than that which is being received from cable companies. Anything else? All right, moving on to Article 36, the parking benefit districts. Um, we, I, I, th I think we've gotten the numbers, but I think people just wanted to talk or have, ask questions about the parking benefit districts or the appropriation or the balance or whatever. Some people, so who has, who has the questions? On parking benefit. Somebody had questions that's why we didn't vote on it. Hmm. I think I can Sorry. summarize them. Um, so, so the parking benefit district is um, sort of gathering money. So there's more money than it's being um, spent this year. And we were just wondering if there was a plan for that. Is there sort of a larger project that the money is going to go into in the next couple of years? Yeah. Or, you know, what's going on? Yeah. So, if I could, you know, this year's budget projects to spend about 110,000 more than we expect to bring in. And that is because we finally are hoping to do some work inside the Russell Common lot. Okay. Uh, and in a few other areas, to be frank, we've been attempting to do that work over the past few years and have only been able to get bits and pieces yeah. done. Yeah. So, it's, you know, the, the large balance is frankly due to you know, sort of a capacity issue with trying to engineer and get some of these projects up to bid in the context of all of the other engineered work that's going on. I know I've heard the Russell Common lot being talked about in many different ways at DPW if you start wanting for various money into it. Yeah. Um, is it sort of repaving in it, plenty of trees? What what sort of the so the the bulk of the work is to rebuild all the medians and islands. Mm -hmm. So reconfiguring where it'll make, you know, operations better, uh, but also to reconstruct them with an eye towards removing the trees that either are ailing or failing to thrive and, you know, using structural soils and other methods to actually get uh, shade trees planted and try to establish the canopy there considered maybe increasing the lighting in some areas uh, and filling the median islands with a more decorative but forest paving. 
so we can actually infiltrate water and try to create an environment where the trees will uh, grow, but also that will keep some of the weeds and other sort of maintenance headaches at bay, and then potentially to do some work uh, on the landscaping surrounding the land as well. Any other questions on the parking district? Sure. So uh, in the, uh, the budget sheet here, it says that the um, Fiscal 24 projected expenses for 416,000 and the revenues 416,000. Is that correct? So there's no change in the circle, in the, there's, no, there's no change in the balance. Right. And if we actually going to spend all of that money in, in uh, fiscal 24, uh, we're in the, the next column on the actuals through February. We're at 385k expended. So, it's, so we're likely to. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? So, sorry if I missed this in an earlier meeting, but on these parking meters, there was this change where um, providers the new ones input the 15 three 15 minutes. Right in the town, and I'm noticing they're still not fixed on everything. Is that true? And so we're getting more revenue, or are we? Mm -hmm. no, the, the 15 minute free function is working. It just it's like six <laughs> right. <laughs> there are many different steps. Device, what I <laughs> problem being is okay. that when you want more than 15 minutes, so let's say you get 30, that people aren't able to do the 15 minutes and then pay for 15 minutes. Right. It, this is a 15 minute, and this is. Frankly, the way it was supposed to be when we first got in years, they were just never programmed correctly. It is an errant function. It is for 15 minutes or less. So you, you don't get free 15 minutes. In. So let's say you're going to the toy store to buy toys and it's going to take, there's a line, so it takes more than 15 minutes. There's You're going to have to pay for 30. Yes. And you yes. don't get the first 15. Yeah. Right. So that, that's the way it's programmed. It's an errand function for 15 that's minutes. That's not or what less. it used to be. I mean, it's not how it was programmed. No, because the, the other meters weren't, frankly, smart enough to, to, I guess, accomplish that. It was, it would give you 15 minutes and then, you know, do what you will with it. But it was like, you know, that could be 15 minutes or more. Now it is strictly 15 minutes or less for running into, you know, grab takeout or, go to the post office or whatever it may be. But if, if you plan on more than 15 minutes, then yes, you need to actually pay the meter. All right, um, we can move on. Let's skip Article 38 amendments to FY24 budgets right now. We'll come back to it at that at the end. Uh, transportation infrastructure. Sure. So Article 42, Transportation Infrastructure, uh, we sort of colloquially on the uh, town hall call that, call that our Uber money, so that we receive uh, each winter uh, from the Department of Public Utilities based on the number of rides that either originate or terminate uh, via Uber and Lyft and other ride sharing services uh, within the geographic limits of Arlington. Uh, so that is based on a calendar year basis. So for calendar year 22, which is the money we just received this winter, that amount is $23,615.20. And what was the time period that was received for? Sorry. So that is based on rides in calendar year 22. Okay, thank you. And that is, so we're um, appropriating 23615 to, to what? Uh, the language of last year's vote is such that uh, from the Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Fund, to address the impact of transportation network services on municipal roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure 
or any other public purpose substantially related to the operation of transportation network services in the town, including but not limited to the complete streets program accepted by town meeting on May 4, 2015, established in Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 901, or 90I, excuse me, Section 1, and other programs that support alternative modes of transportation. The comment, monies from this fund together with monies from the parking district fund will be used for rehabilitation and or re replacement of sidewalks and other safety improvements. With respect to the comment for these funds that were received, where I would consider purposing those monies is towards the uh, operation of the town's blue bike network, given that we have we do not ha otherwise have a source within the general fund to support the ongoing operation and maintenance of the systems that have been deployed. Questions? Oh. Uh, how much are we spending on the blue bike? Blue bike? I don't have an exact figure off the top of my head, but I can follow I mean, up. Is it a major part of the 23,000? You know, the, the last time I looked at these numbers, I'll admit it was a bit confusing because there's a bunch of money that was spent on sort of like the capital purchase of those items. And I haven't seen that. That was lumped together with costs associated with removing and storing them for the winter, as well as simply operating the network. So I'd want to get back to you with uh, what the exact cost is for operations and maintenance. We're actively working towards moving the blue bike docking stations off of the public right away so that we don't each year have to spend significant amounts of money to have them moved and stored elsewhere. <clears throat> Trying to reduce the uh, cost burden on the docking stations and identify sources of funds that are not within our general funds for that. Charlie. So can you comment on the uh, blue bike program in general? Is it, are we still funding it, or subsidizing it, or is it paying for itself? Uh, I think I could comment generally and say, I don't think it's fully paying for itself yet. But I'm not sure to the extent we're subsidizing it because we have been able, we've been successful in receiving grant funds to date to support it. And I believe we're pursuing some additional grant funds. So sorry for the so who, who answer, not answer. Yeah. Uh, right now we have the, our transportation planner taking the, a close look at blue bikes and I do believe we have uh, a memo that may have been shared with the capital, capital. Yeah. that we could probably circulate to this opinion. I apologize. I don't know all the details off the top of my head. That would be helpful if we could. Thank yeah. you. Other questions on Article 47? So we don't have the data yet to say, thank you for riding Blue Bike. Town of Arlington contributed this many dollars and cents to your latest ride. Or, or maybe we do, but I don't know what that contribution is as we sit here today. Other questions? All right, uh, onward. Uh, 48 legal events and identification. Yes. Yeah. So um, the legal defense and indemnification article, uh, we're not seeking any appropriation in legal defense fund. And we are seeking an in, in in appropriation of uh, $15,161.50. Um, um, this money is to provide for the medical expenses for public safety employees who are on medical retirement. So they apply in the year ahead, we plan a budget, and then we match it with an exact appropriation. So this is to cover things associated with medical costs like co-pays, durable medical equipment, and those sorts of similar costs. And this budget flexes moderately up and down every year. Questions on that? I said 16,000. It's 15,000. One hundred and sixty-one dollars and thirty-four cents. What article is that? Four 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 days. Days. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. I think the next 
one is article 53 stratton schools sure so a bit of a late breaking update on this particular warrant article which i can certainly uh speak to tonight but after reviewing with town council turns out there actually isn't an appropriation needed or associated with this warrant article so really what will proceed before town meeting is just the authorization for the takings associated with the installation of the sidewalk it's going to be funded by the 1.6 million dollar mass dot grant uh, that leads up to uh, the stratton school so it is expected based on town council's recommendation that this warrant article would actually be moved to the docket for the select board to make the main motion and report on because it wouldn't have an appropriation, but they serve as the board of survey and would be the ones performing uh, the takings and pursuing temporary easements for somewhere between 30 and 35 properties, most of them temporary easements, one of them being a permanent easement. So we're, we're currently underway with an RFP. We're actually in the in the midst of that project now and doing an RFP for the appraiser to help us through uh, that process. So um, are these public ways, a butters to public ways and you're doing an easement on their properties for the sidewalks, right? Yeah, so it's, they're mostly construction easements, which say so you, you pay for the temporary use or access to a portion of their property while you're constructing a new sidewalk within the public right of way. So largely what gets built is on our property, but you get a construction easement that extends onto their property during construction. And we understand there may be one permanent easement. So we, we I, I don't know the crux of why that is. I, we haven't seen like the final design plan, but that could be, you need to go around a utility pole or, or something and you, you bump into someone's property. So, yeah. excuse me, it's a little bit off topic, yeah. but I was, the issue came up near Bishop, but it turns out it's a private way where they got rid of the sidewalks. So it wouldn't be able, I was told it wouldn't be able to fit into a school safe program like this. Is that your understanding too? Because they're a private way, so there's no place to put the sidewalk. Because there's a street they remove sidewalks. I think we can finish Stoke Rock. So I'm guessing it'll be pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. So it's not safe. I mean, it doesn't mean it's so safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't say one way or the other if the safe routes to school grant program prohibits, uh, you know, crossing over private ways. But I suspect that that's probably not a project that SDOT wants to, yeah. wants to get into because we don't have the authority, you know, to fully grant and access, but I'm sure Michael knows more about this than I do. Mascot will fund uh, safe routes to schools on land that the town uh, controls. So if the town opted to take to take the, the width of a sidewalk on a private way, that would become eligible. It's, it's a very dangerous stretch. There. Yeah, so Especially yeah, in the winter. Perform you know, Everybody walks up in the street. <laughs> Uh, Rebecca, did you have a I found the answer to my question. Thank you. Okay. So, are you uh, seeking an appropriation here? Yeah. Do you want us to vote no action on this, or do you want us to do a zero appropriation? Uh, I guess what I would say is, you know, I can confirm with council that I, I'm not sure this body would even need to take a vote, given that they're going to put the warrant article hearing. In front of the select board because there is no appropriation. Uh, if it says appropriation, the moderator will be looking for this committee to make yeah. a recommendation. Um, if if we did a zero appropriation like we do, we could, okay. and then you run into something next year, you we could transfer we could transfer money from the reserve fund into it, if that might be helpful. Okay. Yeah. If, if that if that is a practice that makes sense, then I, I might have missed this, Jim. What how is the town going to pay eventually for the appraisals and the awards of damages? So through existing fiscal year 24 uh, chapter 90 monies that came in through the fair share apportionment for the additional allotment. <coughs> so this work's already largely underway, so we really can't necessarily wait for July 1. Yes. 
other questions? All right. Um, let's skip over 55 and come back to that. Um, Article 56, the prudent investor rule. All right. So um, if I may take the prudent investor rule. So the prudent investor act was signed in August of 2023. And what this allows for is um, trust funds specifically to be invested uh, beyond the what's called the legal list. And the legal list in Massachusetts contains currently set every July 1st, 22 stocks that are very sort of vanilla uh, blue chip stocks and 35 mutual funds and ETFs, which are just sort of, you know, blended stock groups of stocks. Um, and so what this law does, it allows the trustees to either on their own or through a, um, you know, a financial advisor, which is who the town would use to invest these stocks with, um, sure. could allow for anticipated higher returns. Um, and so there are sort of rules that must be followed. Um, if we accept this uh, portion of state law um, and they surround sort of how the money would be managed. Um, and um, yeah, that's the gist of it. All right, questions. And is this something the select board will be reporting on? Uh, yeah, the select board has already voted on this. Uh, it was also voted previously by the Board of Commissioners of Trust Funds as well. Uh, Dean and then Charlie. So if you can walk me back, through, walk us back through that legislation. Um, so what you're saying is it would give um, expanded investment options, and then who has the authority to make those decisions for the expanded investment options? Um, well, by state law, it's the trustees, and so with the town, it would be the treasurer collector. Um, and so ultimately, in the town, we have the board of trust fund commissioners here who set sort of the, the meet annually, as you may be able to explain a little more detail than I could even, um, to discuss trust funds, um, balances within trust funds, how those funds are performing, where they're invested, et cetera. So is so this authority does this law in any way expand the um authority of where to invest general fund funds? No, this is exclusively trust funds. Okay, I don't know if you know we have a history here with general fund investment problems <laughs> in two thousand eight. Getting to the point where I can talk about those things. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Okay. I'm good. Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so <clears throat> this is actually predates 2008, but uh, I think Dean's, <laughs> Dean's memory is pretty good there. But, uh, both in Arlington and throughout the state, there has uh, been a somewhat questionable record of uh, contributory retirement boards investing under their own power, so to speak. And that, uh, the problems therein led to the creation of uh, PERAC, I don't know, 20 years ago or something like that, maybe 15 years ago. And um, I would say overall, at least in the case of Arlington and probably statewide, um, under the management of PERAC, these retirement boards have their performance, the, the funds have improved uh, quite dramatically. And I'm questioning, this seems to me to be a regression because we're, we're not going to take, I mean, I, I'm, I don't have anything against the people on the Board of Trust Fund Commissioners. I think they actually appoint people on the Finance Committee, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> but, uh, no, they're not necessarily professional uh, managers. And even when the Contributory Retirement Board hired professional managers, as Dean is referring to, uh, in the results didn't always work out very well. Whereas with PARAC, you know, it's a larger organization, they have more professionals, and um, they get economies of scale, and things work pretty well. So where are we headed here? 
The only thing I guess I would add, Charlie, is that the you know we delegate the uh, investment and management functions to Rockland. So with this law would do would allow and specifically it only pertains to trust funds would allow Rockland on our behalf to seek alternative likely higher yielding investments, but they still would have to fall under the prudent investor rule, which is that, you know, the mass general law that's quoted that requires, you know, four particular things be taken into account in terms of, you know, risk level, liquidity, and a few other things. So I, would, I just want to note that we, you know, it's not the board of trust fund commissioners themselves performing the investment function that is delegated uh, to a financial delegated institution. By, by who? Uh, I guess by the board through the treasurer. So uh, have, have we reported? Uh, I, mean, I don't recall seeing any reports on the performance of the trust funds. Um, has the performance been subpar or acceptable? What do we know about that? Yeah, the um, well, the board of trust fund commissioners is who would be you know, looking at these reports, and um, I believe that they have been acceptable. I don't know exactly what that means, but they, uh, you know. Because they have been bound to the legal list, they have lagged behind over the last few years significantly over what the markets at large have done. If that makes sense. Um, by design, the legal list is very conservative. And so um, that's, yeah. Sure, we could probably figure out or get from them the rate of return has been yeah so how do we how are we going to know in the future that this was a good decision i, I mean i'm just concerned that uh, you know we've had problems in the past and i'm concerned that this may go down our path again. Hmm. This, is this a new state law that enables the towns to adopt this right Yes. How how recent is this? August 2023. It went into effect, and then it was has been recommended by the yeah. Mass Collectors and Treasurers Association. So through the treasurer, that was brought before the Board of Trust Fund Commissioners. They were excited and interested in doing so. It's also something that the Board of Trustees for the Robbins Library was interested in, in trying to sort of get higher yields on uh, many of the Towns trust funds. So none of these people making these decisions are involved in the investment management that you just mentioned. <clears throat> right? The people that are most excited about it have the least involvement in investment management. Right. right. Is what you just said. It's exactly where we delegate the investment management to the professionals. Topher, then Rebecca, then Sophie, and now John. Um, how much total money are you talking about? It's it's a significant sum. You know, it's yeah, it's about twenty eight million dollars spread across eighty eight trust funds, which are spread into eight categories. And I was a little unclear who, uh, who makes what decision because you said. There's the trust fund commissioners, and they need to do some things. They do something through the treasurer, but then everything is delegated to this Rockland company. Yep. So, is the yeah. treasurer just like that's a sort of the formal, they're the formal uh, fiduciary, I guess you'd say, that you know, the, 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 the signs on the dotted line or whatever? Right. Yeah. yeah. I see the treasurer is sitting between Rockland and the board of trust fund commissioners, right? They're not. Interacting directly with Rockland, you know, the information flows through the treasurer. And it is just saying to Rockland essentially, you can give a broader, you have a broader portfolio that you can. Right. Yeah, it doesn't necessitate any action, but it says. And no. so, and when you mentioned the library trustees, now are they separate from the, the, the separate board of trust, trust fund commissioners, right? So yeah, they're, they're a separate board of they're trustees. They're separate. Yeah, board of trustees. So they would go through the treasurer as well, though, from the standard of Rockland. Yes. Yeah, the treasurer is the custodian of all yeah, of our trust funds. Thank you. Rebecca. 
Thank you. Excuse me. Um, this is related to Christine's question. First off, about this is so recent. Is it correct that no other cities and towns would have done this yet? Because it's so recent, or do you know of any that have already passed? Uh, presumably, some folks, if they had a fall town meeting, okay. could have adopted it. I don't know that off here. Okay. Um, and so I just want to understand what the change would do. So you're saying currently under the current system, there's you said a list of a certain number of stocks and a certain mutual yep. funds. Would this mean that there's a much longer list or no list at all and they get, you know, really open discretion? Yeah, it would remove the list requirements. So okay. so the 22, maybe you can I read what these so just to give you a, a crosscut, the, sure. the legal list this year is Abbott Laboratories. Atria or Altria Group, which is formerly Philip Morris, American International Group, B of A, Bristol Myers Squibb, Coca Cola, Consolidated, Edison, Eli Lilly. So they're very large public, you know, like generally American companies. Um, and then, right. They're very low risk in that, essentially, is what the, the state is in. And then there's uh, 35 uh, mutual funds and ETFs, which are of the same nature. They're all sort of Low risk mutual funds, and so what what this does is this would allow for um, the our so Rockland Trust who manages our investments for us to uh, look beyond those twenty two stocks and thirty five mutual funds and build a portfolio that makes sense to them. Um, what would the new restriction be on how crazy they could go? You know, like if they if they just decided you know I think they're going to put all their money or... in Bitcoin and all right. of like right. all of any changes need to be um, they, they don't trade without authorization. Okay, but they don't. But the laws would no longer give them a constraint. Correct. It would just be the judgment of trustees. What's called the prudent investor, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's no right. legal there's no legal reason they couldn't put it in Bitcoin. It's just that we would hopefully have the judgment to say. Well, this no, state there is, law, the yeah. state law yeah. has there are other guardrails. Guard, yeah. Guard, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you, Sophie. How often is this legal list of twenty two updated? Ever? It's updated annually on yeah. July first. Every July one. I, do they actually make changes, or it's just they like reapprove the same list? Um, well, they, they do make some changes because there are some relatively new mutual funds on it. Okay. Um, but I don't think that they make wholesale changes every year, if that makes sense. Okay. If there is a change that's made, um, they notify these companies who typically, like experts who perform this kind of investment. And um, the people who manage these investments are then required to move investments out of things if they fall off the list. So say we move to 21 stocks next year. If we happen to have something invested in that lucky one, we'd have to redistribute that. We'd have to sell them and invest it somewhere else currently. Anything else, Sophie? No. Um, I'll Jones. Um, similar question. Does Rockland have any sort of historical record on performance, you know, in, in the constraints that are proposed as opposed to the the constraints there are now over you know good markets and bads. Is there is there any you know past performance or you compare saying how much better would it be or worse? No, well, I, I asked that same question. I it's, don't have an answer right now. Well, that's not good. Yeah, <clears throat> but just because we don't have the information back. Oh, but but you're going to get yeah. that information. Okay, good. Thank you. Can, can, can yeah, we're back on. wondering how we've you know if, if we had how had we that, have we'll... performed versus. How we think we could have performed if we were right. I didn't know if Rockland was managing some other funds under the proposed new rules that would be used as a metric uh, again I, through good and bad markets. I don't think they're managing any of our funds under a separate set of rules. Well, but anybody but we could look at, at some other investment they have and what the return right. could have been. It, it'd be good again, just again, over you know, good and bad, you know, back before 2008 or something, yeah, uh, to see uh, how we would have done historically. Uh, Charlie and then Jennifer. So, so do we have? Uh, well, I'll use the term of protocol or practice on how we are going to monitor the performance under this new regime. Uh, and you know, this is not a ad hominem subject, but a statement. But you know, we have a new financial director, a manager of the town. We're very pleased to see you here. We have a new treasurer. 
Um, we, our controller's been here a couple of years, but we sort of revamped our whole financial structure. Yeah. And now we're talking about making a fairly substantial change in a significant portfolio. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, I, you know, in principle, it might be the best thing to do, but somehow we should have a process or a protocol in place to evaluate what we're doing with metrics that can be presented to the Board of Selectmen of the Finance Committee in town, town meeting. Do we have that? No, but we're working on it. Believe it or not, the town doesn't even have a written investment policy to date, and that's something we've actually requested of Rockland, and they've provided us some examples that exist from other municipalities so that we can consider adopting and codifying something. But you're right. Look, looking back, we have not been able to identify something as a team, but we identify that as something that we should have and we need to work towards. So we had uh, developed a policy um, in the, the famous 2008 incident noted by Dean. Didn't we have a great, Dean, didn't we have a great policy back then? We did, but it said we would stick in the legal list, basically. Stay in the rules. Um, <clears throat> but I think that policy dealt more with like general fund money just to make sure very clear that we are going to put it into crazy things again. Jennifer, thank you. I just want to clarify what the prudent investor rule is, and I know that it varies by state. This is something where a financial pr professional would think would be prudent, <clears throat> right? Is this that's sort of the anyone who's at, yeah, anyone who's acting as the sort of the trustee yeah. or the um, so not not what a person on the street would think is prudent, but what somebody who's right. really deep in the weeds who really knows financial stuff that what that person would think would be. Right. It still lays out criteria, really. Right. They still have to diversify. They still have to consider right. X, Y. So you know, that's laid Bitcoin out in the would statute. Probably not be in there, given mm -hmm. you know sort of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll pass it. Uh, okay. Two questions. You said that the uh, select board and the trust fund commissioners have supported this. Yep. Okay. Uh, one of our members might be able to do this, answer this, but um, if the does the board of trust fund commissioners also control the investment of library trust funds? I don't believe so, but if, if someone has a different answer to that. Okay. And then the second question is, does the, is the treasurer simply an administrative official? ministerial official or can he tell the board of trust fund commissioners that's crazy i'm not going to do it i would i would think the latter is true the latter is true the treasurer has the treasurer can override the board of trust fund okay so the treasurer is a bit of a uh, control factor here okay thank you other questions john and then grant yeah. would this impact the um the opep uh, trust fund was that different? No, nope, that is OPEB lives on its own, managed separately. Yeah. That? Is that? I believe that the town meeting uh, moved to move the OPEB management under the contributory funding board last year. Right. Right. Grant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, folks said the the. It was nice that Brock gave you some samples of what they did for other towns to help kind of put. Um, does that mean those are other towns that they manage money for? I, presumably, yes. Do we know what the track record for those towns? Can we find uh, Yeah, most likely. You don't. You don't do we even know what towns they. I, I don't know. No. Thank you. Other questions. Okay. Yeah, so you said that Rockland can't make trades without authorization. Authorization from whom? From the treasurer. From the treasurer. Gosh. I guess just a clarification, not to get on that point, but it sounds like the treasurer is the has a lot of power. The treasurer is the custodian of so all the treasurer can kind of veto some crazy suggestion from the commissioners, but also they can perhaps pursue some crazy thing on their own as well. Theoretically, yes. Um, but Rockland would still be bound by acting prudently. So they ultimately could over, you know, deter either the treasurer or 
a board of trust fund commissioners from doing something. It's been proven. It's <laughs> They're pretty cute. Yeah. Right. Would, would they have a role like the a financial advisor for me would be like, you want to get a slightly more risky portfolio or yes. a very conservative portfolio? They might ask that question. Those are the exact then, kinds of questions that they ask. And so the treasurer might say, oh, yeah, you don't need to be lucky. <laughs> That's what I would do about this <laughs> But that is a possibility that would be a risk for us if, if something's a little up. Right. It's a possibility, but it's an unlikely. Uh, the treasurer is also a fiduciary. Right. And, and, and again, the state law has some parameters around that. Right, but I'm assuming that the whole idea is that the reason for doing this is it allows people to, to do something that's more riskier. Mm -hmm. Not Maybe not imprudent, but riskier. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You say risk, we say yield. Annie. Yeah. So another thing that I remember from 2008 is that the select board came to an attempt to gain control of the investment progress by advising the treasurer to allow select board members to be involved in the choice of investment advisors and suggesting that the treasurer should have an advisory committee, all of which failed because at the time the treasurer was elected. Can you remind me what the treasurer's chain of command is now? Like who does the treasurer work for directly and who does hire the title? Yeah. So the treasurer works for Alex, and Alex works for Jim, Jim works for the select board. Okay. And uh, because he's in that chain of command, or they are in that chain of command, so I, she, she, I know, <laughs> very badly pronounced. Um, we could, um, create some advisory or oversight structures along those lines now and um, that would provide the kind of oversight that, in other words, more heads wrapped around the problem so it's better. And although, even though the treasurer is standing between the trustees of the funds and the advisory, maybe some support for the treasurer and making good decisions would be part of the way to resolve this problem. Yeah, the, the, yeah I just want to say that this isn't something that I would want our treasurer to do alone or in a vacuum right. or in a silo that I'm involved with. When we're considering decisions, they'll be brought to the town manager for approval as well. These aren't things that are just, uh, we're not going to say, you know what, Bitcoin's on the rise. You know, let's put money. It's not, I mean, we take our, you know, the, as custodians of these funds, we take it very seriously. It's something that we're aware of our sort of responsibilities and that um, we don't mess around with. Right, and it would be because of that same chain of command, it would also be possible for the select board to meet in public every other week to require some kind of public quarterly or annual reporting mm -hmm. on. The and, and I think even before that point, maybe, like, is we work to develop an actual investment policy that would lay out some level of guidelines that we would want both the treasurer and or our fiduciary uh to live by right. in the development of that you have the opportunity for public process to to right. get folks to weigh in and you know if we wanted to you know if ever came the time that we thought it was proper to consider a change in who you were going to have manage those monies that again that could also be a process where you know we evaluate different firms with expertise with, with more heads and with additional folks. So I think there's probably a few different opportunities that haven't existed previously that could exist in the future. Right. And so, so because we would be developing an investment policy, then the policy making board, which is the select board, would necessarily be the board that would figure out how to do that and direct staff. Mm -hmm. Got it. Shirley. Would it really make sense to uh, actually present this proposal to town meeting in a future year after we've developed uh, this process? I mean, what, what Andy described are some similar set of um, procedures and processes to oversee the management of the outside investment advisors and, and have a level of transparency that is available to the public as well as the board of selectmen. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a possibility. You know, what I also say is this article doesn't actually change anything, right? It doesn't give a directive to our uh, 
investor to make any changes. Then why do we need it if it doesn't change? It. Right. What I'm saying is it, it, it provides authorization for a local option. But we could sit here and say, well, we don't want to make any changes and unless and until you know a policy has been approved and publicly vetted, then there's going to be guidelines for it. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um let's skip master plan right now and the local option factor. Are you thinking of any? Uh, are you proposing any <laughs> Not this year, no. Uh, if I could opine for a second on the fact that there is a Municipal Empowerment Act that folks may have heard about that will be, uh, you know, it's a bill that has a number of provisions that impact municipalities, uh, one of which is some uh, additional possibilities with respect to local options. It will raise the ceiling on local meals tax from 0.75% to 1%. And it also raises the uh, hotel tax from 6% to 7%. And it also introduces the possibility of a motor vehicle uh, excise, like essentially a surcharge of up to 5%. So there is uh, an act with provisions related to local option taxes that was recently proposed by the governor, obviously is nowhere uh, near past or, you know, have, providing the ability for municipalities to consider it yet. But I say that as something that could be uh, brought before town meeting at its annual session next year, should things proceed as proposed. Of course, we know that is all it's going to be subject to much debate over the course of this session potentially next all right so on, on the subject of local taxes um we we recently uh i just said recently i can't remember what it was but we did we authorize uh sales of marijuana in any town are we getting any revenues from that or are these businesses closing up what's what's the, the whole status of that venture we are receiving uh, marijuana excise tax revenues. There was a recent change uh, via the Cannabis Control Commission for, I think they were called local impact fees, where you used to be able to charge a flat percentage of revenues. That, is sent, that has essentially been uh, nixed, uh, and new host community agreements will need to be executed with all uh marijuana vendors that replaces that sort of flat arbitrary fee of sales and that will go into effect so that will end sometime in april but you, you'd still collect the excise tax revenue but the new host community agreements are gonna diminish the sort of local uh return with respect to marijuana revenue and it has to be tethered directly to expenses incurred by the municipality <clears throat> as a result of ha having uh, those establishments in our community. So it puts the onus on us to say, well, we've had this many calls or, you know, any number of things to justify uh, a charge back to those vendors. Any other questions on the poll factor? How do we tax alcohol shops that sell alcohol? We don't tax them locally. It's, it's a state tax, it's not a local. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's go back to Article 55, the clock slide. All righty. Excuse me, did we cover 57, the master plan update? Okay. Uh, not yet. We will. And that's because they are very closely related. I have a plan here. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so, did anyone read this cover to cover and realize there was no budgeted amount for uh, the Fox Library warrant article appropriation? Mm -hmm. So, we have been carrying 
uh, a placeholder in our draft shared warrant for the warrant article. We, at the time it was submitted, were the time this budget was submitted in January, we're unaware of what the actual financial ask was associated with the uh, public library construction warrant article. So that $150,000 that is being sought does not presently live in the manager's FY25 budget. So I just wanted uh, to call that out. Once that came to our attention, after this budget was printed, we've been sort of trying to identify ways to essentially create capacity to support uh, that request. And one of the ways that was identified is via Article 57 for the master plan, uh, pursuing instead a no action vote of this committee with no appropriation. There was $50,000 proposed, but due to a recent uh, change in the guidance from the treasury, it allows ARPA money uh, to be spent on Title I product projects, i.e. CDBG eligible projects, for which CDBG was already funding the other half of the master plan. So we're proposing to sort of supplant and hold harmless the master plan, uh, but not necessarily seek a general fund appropriation. So that would essentially free up $50,000 of the $150,000 asked. And though not a warrant article is being considered tonight, I don't know if you've already considered it to late to date with the town, uh, the town celebrations warrant article. Uh, we had originally proposed a budget for the 250th celebration through the general fund of $50,000. But at the same time, where, you know, in the past few weeks, we have sought, uh, an earmark from our full legislative delegation of meeting, have met with them all individually at town hall and put forth uh, an earmark request for the 250th celebration to uh, cover a contribution to the Foot of the Rocks project, to make a significant contribution to parade, reenactment, other activities and festivities associated with the 250th celebration and seeking funds to offset what are expected to be pretty significant public safety costs with that uh, week of events in April, 2025. So we're also thinking that should we hear something soon in our in our legislators, so they can make no promises and may not be able to meet our full request for you know upwards of $300,000. It's likely they're gonna be able to support this to some extent and if so, we could consider recommending a downward departure of that 250th celebration budget from 50,000 down to 25,000, but still maintaining 25,000 so that we can meet our intermissible agreement obligation with Lexington, Concord, and Lincoln, but still having all the funds we need uh, to support the celebration and activities. And that gives you 775. 75 and the box library needs 150. 150. So the only other avenue of funding was going back to the libraries themselves and saying, Hey, if we can't identify all of the funds uh, within the town's budget to support this, to what extent uh, could the library provide additional sources of funds? Uh, and they're able to commit uh, $25,000. So we find ourselves in a position of being essentially $50,000 short as compared to what was in the proposed budget for warrant article appropriations. And that's sort of where that stands as of today. So the appropriation being sought in R55 is 150 or is, are, are we, um, yes, it, being asked to appropriate 75 with the rest being made up through the library. So, with the language being to vote to raise and appropriate or take from available funds the sum of 150,000, I believe for the purposes of that library construction grant, it needs to read for the uh, 
for the full hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that's what was explained to me. You know whether or not that is all raised and appropriated, or with some portion taken from existing funds under the control of the library, would probably be detailed in uh, the vote comment. Questions, um, Annie, Michael, Charlie. So, are we are we sure that the Massachusetts Public Library or the, the people who are sponsoring this, when they say we need one hundred fifty thousand dollars from the town, that all the things you just talked about qualify? Like, in other words, if the library pulls those funds from, say, their own resources be it the trust fund or the friends of or whatever mm -hmm. that still qualifies us for the grant i mean i got the impression this was a town showing good faith move not just uh, so it's something the library director has said she's going to confirm right. but she believed it's a demonstration of local match and commitment it wasn't specific to saying it had to be a town's like a general operating funds we got the impression from the capital planning committee that it couldn't come through the capital plan. Mm -hmm. The town meeting had to appropriate this one. Right, it needed to have its, it own, its own separate warrant article. Right. 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 And, it, and it had to be all local funds, but she's going to confirm that it doesn't have to okay. be it doesn't have just to be general funds. funds but generally, yeah. it has to be $150,000 from the locality. Yep. Okay. All right. I just wouldn't want to endanger the potential downstream funding. Because made wrong. Right. Michael. Happy to hear that you've had our legislative delegation mm -hmm. in uh, and, and, and urge them for, for seeking this once in 50 years uh, chance chance of mm -hmm. doing things to, to, to celebrate local history. I I hope it works because the fifty thousand dollars that was the appropriated spent under the direction of the town's two hundred and fiftieth anniversary committee, half of that's already spent. Mm -hmm. The first twenty five thousand dollars has already been committed to the joint intermunicipal agreement uh, that will bring publicity, public safety coordination, a whole bunch of things that to the public don't look like a celebration. Mm -hmm. So the committee was hoping to have money to actually do stuff. Right. I hope that's still going to happen. Right. Charlie. So uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm I'm uh, someone that plus over this issue of having our separate warrant article and the idea that this can't be funded through the capital plan. The capital plan for decades has funded through uh, borrowing the develop uh, what we call it, architectural or other development plans for mm -hmm. capital what would eventually be capital projects even because even before the capital project was approved and, and i believe that that's uh, permitted by state law now i don't know if we're planning a special town meeting this year or not but um the capital plan has also historically um I'm, I can think of the, we did it with the police department, we did it with a number of different buildings. No, we've, we've had um, money voted by town meeting as part of a capital plan, but voted in a separate warrant article in a special town meeting because we needed to get the funding there in order to build something when the weather turned. You know, we couldn't wait till August or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why there can't be a separate article um, and a special town meeting that addresses this need but it's still part of the capital budget. And, and if that, um, you know, that, that uh, whatever it turns out to be is, uh, you know, $150,000 or less, depending on how you parse this, it's, it's not gonna materially change the capital budget because it will be bonded, you know, and it's gonna be just spread over five years. So I don't know why we're not thinking about that as a path to, uh, you know, assuring that grant. Well, I would say is, as of right now, there hasn't been a vote to hold a special town meeting. Uh -huh. Okay, well, that makes it hard. 
<laughs> but but I'm also not aware of the exact requirement that makes this live alone as its own warrant article. I know that to be a case, but I don't know, and I wasn't involved with the discussion with Capitol to understand why it why it could or couldn't be absorbed into the uh, capital budget, as it were. So I, I mean, I, it seems to me if, if it doesn't require a separate warrant article, uh, which is sort of a weird requirement to my viewpoint. It should be included in the capital budget because it is. This is a capital expenditure. Is this time sensitive? Yeah. So we're sort of backed up against the wall to mix that right now. If this is what we want to do, if the town wants to pursue this out. On the Yale Library project, um. Could the trustees you know, use their money for the 150? The Board of Library Trustees? That I don't have an answer to. Thank you. Other questions? And the 250th celebration is asking for, well, we'll ask for a $25,000. Have, have they presented a budget yet? yet? Okay. So you will tell them to. They will <laughs> confirm that. And again, to Michael's point, I think that when we programmed 50,000 in there originally, it's because we knew that's what we needed for the celebration. We're saying is we're, we're expecting to receive offsetting funds that would make that extent of appropriation not entirely necessary. So it's going to be a bit of a, just a timing exercise. So we have to report back on exactly where, what the status is and where that stands in a few weeks. So we did the library, the other question, we did the library, the master plan, we talked about the 450th. Uh, I think the only thing left is amendments to FY24. Talk about that. Don't think we're prepared to go that far today. If that's okay. Do you know when you'll know whether you'll need to be a transfer appropriation? I would say we would know by this time next week, but I'm not sure it's as pressing as initially thought. All right. I think we have covered all of the warrant articles, but anyone can correct me. I'm sure it was that discussion on uh, Article 38, the 20 changes to the yeah. 24 budget. Yeah. I think that covers everything. So do we have other questions for the manager? Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> so this came up at one of our meetings in the last week or two. And it's also something that I've observed um, in the course of discussions in the town. And that is, um, I'm not sure if it's the recreation department or the public works department, but we have apparently closed at least three playgrounds in the town. Uh, one of which is in the Monongahara Park, which you know I'm particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> in the other, there are two playgrounds, I think, closed at the Thompson School. Um, and I'm trying to understand why that is, because um, some of the local um, Bernardark's friends, friends of Bernardark's Park, or really, um, got a professional engineer to examine the playground uh, when this was being discussed. And the, the engineering consultant basically said some minor um, maintenance would maintain the life of this uh, playground for some four years. And um, Suddenly it was gone. And I'm not sure, but I think the same thing is happening at the Thompson School. 
And it seems to me that the town should be undertaking, you know, reasonably diligent efforts to maintain these playgrounds and, and, and not, not to take them out. And if you take them out, suddenly there's a huge demand on capital. And in the meantime, the citizens are deprived of the opportunity, the children are deprived of the opportunity to use these facilities. And I'm, I'm wondering, has this been, um, Mr. Manager, at your direction or at the Recreation Department or what? How does this process take place? So that it wouldn't necessarily be at my direction, no. But the Recreation Department and overseeing the playgrounds has an obligation to do those safety audits by a Consumer Product Safety Commission licensed uh, inspector. And I think what has happened is when those inspections have been conducted, you know, whatever, you know, I don't know how they categorize the violations with criticality and whether they could uh, cause harm to life or limb. And once you get that report and you're on notice, I think it has been the standard operating procedure to close the playgrounds down until you can make the necessary repairs. And as I understand it, there has been some sites where those repairs are easy to address. It's, you know, add more of the wood fiber mulch or, you know, trim back some branches that are presenting a hazard. Or it could be, hey, that slide is cracked and broken and the slide needs to be temporarily removed and you put just like an observation bubble over it and it sort of renders that uh, component useless. So, you know, that's my understanding of the process is we're required to conduct the inspections. I think now that we're conducting inspections, we're probably identifying some combination of uh, deferred maintenance, but also some assets that have reached their reached or past their life expectancy. Who's responsible for doing the maintenance on these playgrounds? It would be the Public Works Department, uh, generally at the direction of the Recreation Department, who undertakes the audits. If we can conduct the maintenance in house through public works, right? We can replace swing seats, chains, tighten bolts, uh, you know, a series of activities for which we have the expertise to perform in house, sort of like low risk type of activities. And then the replacement of slides and other pieces of equipment when it gets into the compatibility and making sure it's the right manufacturer and you have all the fasteners and the right torque and all that. That is subcontracted out to a specialty vendor. So, do we have a record of doing that? Of doing what? Maintaining these playgrounds. I mean, it, it, you know, we've seen to come up to a point where we say, oh, this, they've got to go. Yeah. That, that seems to me to be the earmark of, uh, I don't know, neglect over a period of time until. You know, it either can be maintained or not. I'm, I'm just concerned. We're talking, we don't have 100 play, playgrounds now. You know, we're taking three offline, that's pretty substantial. Right. And I think when, you know, when I first became aware of this, sort of my concern was you know, don't, don't conduct all your inspections in one day or in one week. You, <laughs> right. you, you jeopardize the assets that we have to make available to the public so that it should be, uh, you know, staggered in a manner where we should be able to avoid. A situation like that with respect to maintenance, right? Like once the issue is identified, right, we're we're tracking what gets fixed because you need to sort of hit every item on that report. But other than that, it would be looking to see if there were web QAs or you know is, other work orders documented. Is parks and recreation completely autonomous. The committee, not entirely, no. So how do how do how does the town manage their activities? Through the recreation director who, who reports to the town manager's office. Thank you. And Michael. Speaking of maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, do we have an overall estimate of how much material maintenance has been deferred and will eventually come due? On town owned buildings. On town owned buildings, we do not have an exact figure now. And it's not, not something that's been studied in a number of years. 
something a lot of large in institutions have done, at least to carry that, that number on the side of the books, not in the books. Yeah. So I don't want to sound too congressional here. So you don't know when the next leaky roof is going to cause the ceiling to collapse beneath it. Nope. We presently don't have any money set aside to perform, you know, that full portfolio analysis of our buildings. And how are we going to replace the Kubu on top of town hall? Uh, hopefully through CPA funding. Um, you identify a big reason why the facilities department was created in the first place. Mm -hmm. it, and it's only it's a little bit more than that. It's still two years to correct us. But we don't have something where you can say, okay, over the next 20 years here, here's what we think we're going to need to spend. Yeah. And that, that costs money, significant amount. Dave. Can I go back to the um, Thompson School playground? There's an imaginary line between what the town's playground and the school playground. Yes. Who's responsible for the school, the talk a lot at the school? Uh, the school department through the facilities department be responsible. It goes back to the town per se. It goes back as part of the building. Yeah. It just basically it wouldn't be the public works department. Right. It would be yeah. another town facility. Yeah. Because the issue down there is uh, you know, who's on first, who's on second. Okay. And it, it's it, there's a major conflict going on between People say, well, it's not my responsibility, it's your responsibility. And that's been going on for both. Yeah. And I'm aware of at least four or five months. Right. And, and I'm not aware of any of the specifics, so it's something I can look into. Yeah. It just strikes me that we have a brand new facility down there that put in a, a brand new father park, yeah. I call it a father park, a little playground, and it's all fenced in. I mean, it's, you can't go near the place mm. because it's been. I guess for lack of a better term, it's been pulled offline. That, that's the top lot, the 2009 yeah. build. <clears throat> yes, you mentioned the town hall before. Are you, in, are you applying for CPA planning this year? Not this year, no. Okay, so Th this year, the CPA money that was already received is being used to remove the cupola, roof over. Render the building weather tight. Okay. Make, make repairs inside the Lions Hearing Room. This year, we broached the topic of bonding against CPA to potentially support this project uh, in the long run, not in the context of an application, but as an idea and a principle. And, uh, you know, sort of said, you know, this is coming down the pipeline. The next step will be to uh, appropriate money for. You know, design and engineering specifications and then pursue the construction work. Well, actually, build the new cupola. Yeah. We build the new cupola as well as manage the remainder of the envelope. Like well, that, that's one small envelope, well, one small I issue. Yeah, yeah. I was going to get to that one. We've got windows falling out. But the uh, cupola's already been designed. Because yeah. I've already right. you know, heard of at least one place workspace getting trashed about beyond the line of scaring them. Yeah, from snow that rain. Yeah. Okay, and then one question. In the town hall itself, I mean, what is the the total bill anticipated for doing everything in town hall? <laughs> yeah. I estimate that the envelope in and of itself will be on the order of magnitude of ten million. Just for the, that's just the yeah, that, that's your your roof <clears throat> being both your flat roof, your slate roof, uh, masonry parapets, clock tower, windows, some door work, repairs to some of the limestone. So that's good at stabilizing uh, the building and the structure. Yeah, so that includes the cupola? Also? That would include the reconstruction of the new cupola. That's, that and the windows of the two would be the two most significant costs. Mm -hmm. Uh, entirely different subject. A number of uh, committees and commissions of the town have are putting numbers in their budgets for things like their own websites and their own email systems and things like that. It, it's small money, so it's not a big financial thing. We do have some questions about sort of policy issues. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, legal archiving for any anybody that might have any commissions might be susceptible for your requests, right? Or sort of freelancing on a website that in some ways represents the town but might not have yeah. the right controls. Um, and I know we did this ourselves a few years ago, so uh, yeah. um, so I'm just if there are any guidelines or policies that we might refer to when we're reviewing these budgets. So we do have a communications policy. And one thing I would say is something that I'm finding going through, really through my first budget process here is that there are some boards, committees, and commissions that are presenting budgets to this committee that frankly I have never seen. Right. They're seeking increased budgets that aren't carried in these lines. And I'm like, well, that that is a process that doesn't have doesn't seem to have had the vetting that I would expect to see it have. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that we identified as an issue that we want to address for next year, right? Like if you if you ask me which committee was it was proposing their own website, I don't know. Okay. We don't. Yeah. 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 Right. Like, and like the things are coming straight here, but I right. you know, I was, I was meeting with a number of commissions the other day and like, you know, here's the here's the budget and the increase we proposed for the finance committee was just like. <laughs> Just so you know, that would have been good to know because yeah, you have yeah. a different printed number yeah. in the book, and it's like, okay, this this is potentially problematic in not knowing exactly how folks intend to spend their money because they're not, you know, it's not a departmental budget <clears throat> being prepared and presented to the town manager, but a sort of sort of living yeah. a bit outside the. Uh, so the so we have a policy that would cover these things. Yeah, we, we do have a communications policy and, okay. and generally it has been to not necessarily allow a lot of different things yeah. uh, to uh, crop like up, to, I'd like to get a copy. but we would expect it to, uh, to advise on that. Because we have a few things that are right, 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 right now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Looking into it. Uh, I think we're, yeah, it's the same issue that you recognized. I was trying to get information, so thank goodness. Right. Right. Like the, at the request of that, I would want, you know, our communications folks to have already reviewed that, and I'm not sure that has occurred. Thank you. Uh, can you yeah. So, a couple questions. The first one might be easy because I've asked it like three years in a row now. Um, so, we've gone through multiple years now of um, really high inflation, right? We had a year that was like seven, a year that was 6.4. I think the last. 12 months this summer ended at 3 3. Everyone was like, Oh, it's going to get out this year. It's great. And I think it popped we around like 3 2 today or something like that, right? Um, so that's obviously in a prop two and a half world, you're outpacing um, caps, right? And you know, and to me, I had to guess. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that was caused some of these like teacher strikes and, and like real acrimonious things, right? I think we were lucky on the school side because I think the override was probably a <coughs> That like hospital thing, right? Um, we hope now we have the town side. I mean, is there any like brewing, like you know, we're gonna turn on the news and find people outside of town hall or picketing your house or anything like that? Like, where are we? <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. We have peace in the kingdom, no peace in the kingdom. It, it is no secret that we have fallen pretty far behind with respect to our comparable communities, but within the but within the spending caps that we live under, we made and we made an effort this year to set aside as much money as we possibly could into the salary reserve to make uh, the strongest and most competitive offers to our bargaining units that we thought we could. And frankly, I'm not sure that's going to be enough. Okay. So yeah. All right. In, question in, two. Inflation is a general go for it. Um, question this is a big macro one. I might have to explain it a little more. Um, so. <clears throat> If I think about the things that are problematic to us is um, after inflation, right? Um, I'm concerned that we're along the way going to become collateral damage at the state aid level for um, an imploding commercial office market, right? So let me give you my thought here. And I want to understand you've heard it, thought about it, whatever, right? So COVID hits, everybody at home, nobody comes back, right? We have a real odd situation because we have no occupancy in buildings. We have income, we have people have leases, right? As you know, um, commercial buildings are valued on the income method, right? So it doesn't matter if there's no one there, if there's revenue coming in, you're fine, right? Well, there's no there's no help on the way, right? Like the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, 
was very clear last week in saying that some regional banks are going to fail, and they are actively stress testing and monitoring the big banks and think they're okay because they don't have this large portfolio or they're going to be belly up places. Okay. So let's translate that to a municipal standpoint. Okay. Um, at the highest level of Prop 2 and F, no big deal. Right? It isn't no big deal. You just raised the levy up to an F, whatever you said, fine. But as these commercial real estate offices come in for abatements, which they're going to win because they have empty buildings, or mm -hmm. or they're going to, like, you, I don't know if it's always the thing they talk about with New York City, like, it's like 30 Empire State buildings of vacants, right? Same thing as in Boston. They just don't have a, a, a catchy tagline that everyone understands. So they're going to get abatements. Yeah. And then these cities, take the city of Boston, who put on a brave face, they're going to have to put that tax rep, that tax onto their residents, onto the residential. That's how Prop Two and a Half works. You set the levy at top, mm -hmm. you work your way down, right? I'm going to guess the mayor of Boston, the administration, city of Cambridge. You could go. They're not going to want to do that, right? So they're going to be like, no, 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 no. We're not putting this large residential real estate increase on our residents. We got to go to Beacon Hill and get them fixed. The fix are pretty limited, right? You come up with some of these flimsy local option tax. I think the governor tried hard to help the bailout for Boston this year. She didn't get it. Um, you change the local aid formula, right? Which they did in 2002, three, four, remember Robbie became governor and he's like, hey, let's just screw over Arlington. That would be fun, right? Um, or you try some kind of broad-based income tax increase that just gets funneled into the places that lose all this money, right? So we have an issue. We have the haves and the have-nots, and it's kind of an interesting setting, right? Because I'm sure, like, Lexington's probably pretty nervous, right, with all that commercial office real estate along the access road. Arlington and Belmont aren't sweating it. They don't have any commercial offices to worry about, mm -hmm. right? Um, but everyone's kind of putting on a brave face at the moment, knowing that, the, that this is going to blow. So what's... What do you think? You got a crystal ball? <laughs> How's this going to play out, and are we going to get hurt? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't know what the timeline is for this playing out, but I think we all know, nope, it's unlikely that preemptive action is going to be taken, mm -hmm. right? Th things will have to fail before a fix, actually, or a fix uh, comes in, is how I see it. So th things generally need to get pretty bad with respect to Beacon Hill making some sweep sweeping change before they will. But we don't know until, we're not gonna know we're gonna get hurt until they hurt us. Yeah, okay, yeah. last question. One of the few times it's been, as you pointed out, like an Arlington or a Belmont to look around and go, yeah. okay, well, <laughs> for once it's really good so to have a really, really <laughs> small commercial <laughs> factory. Right? It's never benefited us before. No, <laughs> it did this time. Last question. Um, what keeps you up at night? What bothers you? Uh, Forget family and all that. Work wise. <laughs> work wise, you've already hit on the two things, right? Like health insurance went up 9%. Our utility rate just went up 40%, right? And we're, we're restricted three and a quarter percent growth. And we have to fund all our contracts in terms of with third party vendors and all these things that keep going up and you know what are we left with for our employees right like how can we fill vacancies and retain staff that's what keeps you up with, within the confines that we have to live in and as we continue to fall further behind with respect to our comparable communities but, but right there there's no fix for that I mean, we, we have to meet our obligations and fund all our contracts and that just leaves folks behind and right like for someone who's worked here since 2009 and has worked with a number of great people like I know what makes the town of Arlington great is its employees right that's how we spend between 75 and 80 percent of our money on people like our human resources are our most you know valuable capital and I find us like sort of right we're seeing that with the number of vacancies we have or the number of people that turn down our job offers or resign to go work in other places that we're no longer like that incredibly highly competitive and sought after community to work for. That's like that 
is what I see as things that we need to collectively work together for over the next couple of years. And thank you for asking that. What's the likelihood of any agreements, including the four town meeting? I wouldn't bet on any of them. I wouldn't bet on it. So not much to report on. We are actively yeah. at the table with four of our groups right now. And uh, it's just really tough. We made, without getting too far into the weeds, we've made better offers than any of the colas they've had over the past six years or more. And it was kind of just, there was no way it was going to work. So we're, we're, it's, we're in a tough spot. Charlie had his hand up. Uh, thank you. I, I'd like to, <clears throat> following Dean's macro view of the world, get back to the mundane maintenance issue. Uh, so on the whole building maintenance uh, discussion before, uh, I understand your, your concerns about that. Uh, you know, the Capital Planning Committee and the Finance Committee was integral in getting the facilities and parking put in place, I don't know, five, six years ago, something like that. And, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we somehow fund what's going on. There. And there, there has been in the past a lot of discussion about the town having a, a call a facilities maintenance software package. And I don't know whether we actually got it or whether we have it or use it or whatever, but we were going to keep in track of major uh, infrastructure and its aging and repair requirements, et cetera. So first thing is, do we have that and do we use it? And secondly, uh, is the facilities department taking advantage? Uh, you know, I, I can't remember the name of this company, but I always think of it as ACDC. But there was a, a company had some name like that. Insight on site. Insight on site. Thank you. <laughs> on site, insight. On site, on site, insight. Right. Thank you. Who, who, you know, right. do yeah. periodic audits and come back and yeah. recommend yeah. maintenance plan. Are we, are we doing either of those two things? We're doing both. What I would say is, with the facilities department, we're a bit behind on the town buildings as we focused on the school buildings. We do have that work order, which, which was where was what was once a work order system is now considered more of an asset management system. And it allows us every time we do a renovation project to take the information and materials from our architectural and engineering consultants and populate them directly in. So you, you manage the assets, you track the work against a piece of equipment. So we did a whole slew with, you know, the money we had in capital plan to build out, you know, those systems for school buildings and we're using it and we're now at least using that system for work orders on the town side. We have rolled that out, uh, but it is not yes, necessarily, we haven't gone through the process of again, hiring a third party consultant to get all that name tag information, figure out exactly what needs to be done and when, and program those preventative and recurring work orders into the asset management software. And we are using on-site inside. We have not used them uh, in a few years. I think the last time we had them out was to do a, a capital needs assessment at the Whittemore Robin House. Uh, so again, you know, one thing we find when, when you do those assessments, they're good at telling you what they, you know, what the items are that need to be done. But as we've seen the the dollar figures or costs that they assign to some of those line items are often don't hold much water and are largely inaccurate. Thank you. Annie, then John, and then Jennifer. Getting back to Dean's 30,000 foot view and also because Charlie says we agreed on two things tonight, so I have to balance that out. Um, <laughs> so if we're facing this, this what sounds like um, more and more of a fiscal squeeze on the town side, having just done their call back to schools and all the way, are we looking at some method for increasing our resources in order to meet those obligations in the future? I mean, it seems to me like most times when we have an overall talking about schools and we're selling on the basis of schools, but we have these other departments that do these critical things that I am not sure the public is always aware how critical they are, mm -hmm. that we may need to be doing some marketing. That's so is something we have discussed with the management team and thinking that, you know, it is, it would behoove us to advance 
the town's interests more strongly the next time the opportunity presents, especially with respect to our employees. Right. To the extent that a tax infusion can help, right? I mean, you can't, I don't know is where we're going to be able to keep up with inflation in a bad year. But right. I think I've been thinking about how to educate the public about what the serious functions are in a more, you know, if you talk to the average person on the street, right, you're going to get, uh, some annoyance about how there's four guys standing around the hole while there's one guy digging, or you're going to get, you know, oh, I don't see the cops in the shop. It's on a cold board. I don't think they really understand. I think I think there's a, a lot of things that folks on the inside know that those cops are doing that are not necessarily obvious, necessarily obvious to the public, or or that they understand how those operations work. Yeah. We need to work on that. That's I think there's next indeed a, a lot that gets taken for granted with what goes into making sure you have water in your home every day and you flush your toilet, it goes somewhere, and you've got a great tree canopy and lots of sidewalks and lots of roads. I think they're the things that take it for granted. But really, I just hear from people about why their yard waste didn't get picked up one time. <laughs> I don't I don't hear anything else. John? Yeah, um, so following up with a lot of the challenges that Dean just brought up, um, <clears throat> I am looking at the school budget this year, and it is up 8% with flat enrollment. So I'm just wondering, is that overly generous, and can we afford that? Isn't that the override? That's, That's the override, override right? A, a chunk of it is the override. Well, well I mean, the, first of all, the override was you know an operating override. I know we've gone back and forth. I know the selectmen did approve these extra programs prior to the override um but just because those extra programs were approved by the selectmen i mean is the rest of the school budget off the table and because there's been some you know fairly generous increases for the last three or four years to the schools as well so in general obviously that's the largest budget and if the town is facing some hard times is anyone looking at the school budget the, with respect to enrollment there's already an agreed upon figure that is used for an adjustment on a year-to-year -year basis and that is the a 50 percent increase or decrease uh per pupil based on the deci uh rate per student so that that is already controlled for in an agreed upon fashion with the the leadership in the town but with you know with respect to the override ads yeah. I, I wouldn't think to sit here and say that that is something that I would be in a position to to claw back or remove. No, because yeah, I mean, I, without doing the math, it does to me. You know, even if you take up that three point one million, there's three point one million that's part of the override. Mm -hmm. So even if you take that out, uh, it still seems like it's well above five percent, a five percent increase in the budget, which to, against the largest budget. You have to add. On top of that, the 3.5% for Gen Ed and 6.5%. So, what I'm hearing, did you see, like, it's just like on, you know, automation? In other words, like, you know, there's numbers that have been set in stone, and we just have to all sit back and watch the budget get bigger and bigger. And we just say, you know, the numbers are set in stone. Okay. But, you know, that would be great if we could afford it and the money was there. But if the money's not there, I would think that someone should maybe take a look at those percentages and say, are they overly gener generous? That's my thought. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say one thing on that point. Um, so as a town, we go out for an override, there are very explicit commitments, and the town has never clawed back those commitments that they've made. Right. So so there were commitments about how much was general, how much was special ed, how much, you know, for these additions. So so, and they were very explicit, right? So, anyone, most recent the, yeah, anyone so paying a little bit of attention to what's going on the override says, oh, here's the list of commitments. You know, I see it, right? But I've just seen the town's never taken back those commitments. They've yeah, so taken back again, that's 3.1 million. Okay, I got it. Yeah. That's locked. No, no, no. The whole, the no, whole all those package. percentages are locked into the Everything is in the, the rate of growth of each budget right. is locked into the override. Yeah. That, that was explicitly in the override. Wait, actually. 
Can you just explain that a little bit? I, I don't know. So the overall I said. The most this, recent overall. Yeah, right. 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 So for, FY20, right. for FY25, 3.1 million yeah. will be added to the, the school budget. All that. Plus the town side can increase their budget by 3.25%. And the school side can increase their budget up to 35 a general budget and up to 6.5 percent for the jury's so you're, you're saying that was all big that's all in, in the explicit yeah. amendment for okay. their right yeah you know you guys yeah. know but i would just say i would bet you know on the average voter who voted for the right has no idea i'm saying itself. the town has you know, never taken back the commitment that no they made that. explicitly okay. politically in an upright i would say um, on page two yeah. where all those are outlined yeah right like those essentially serve as the marching orders when building the budget right so that's how i would perceive that and no more right and, and no and, no more but i it actually, must be because the override wouldn't wouldn't support more yeah right. so two other things one is since we've had a long sit down with rob about the facilities director yeah. um and about the asset management program that he's really happy with and feels that you know he's gotten most of the things in there but what it seems like and, and correct me if i'm wrong is it's mostly things like boilers and some pumps and various things, but it's not necessarily building envelopes, not in the asset. Right. So yeah. any problem with any sort of building an envelope isn't being sort of overseen by that system by itself. We need a separate system to do. Yeah. Is that sound right? Yeah, because I think those those things function less like assets, right? Right. There right. A, it doesn't okay. it, they don't do a work quick work order for a yeah, not a routine lubrication of right. a wall or <laughs> Right, 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 right. I mean, there are there is sort of a sense of the expected life in the same way there is a boiler. Yeah. But it sounded like they weren't being monitored in quite the same way as they'd be something else. Yeah. I think, you know, as part of that larger discussion, the thing that we sort of have been, I don't want to say battling with, but grappling with is right, like, you know, routine ceiling maintenance, floor maintenance, or painting, right? Like right. carpets, painting, ACT tile, as we call it, right? Like, those things we used to sort of carry amounts within the capital plan mm -hmm. at certain levels, and then you can go sort of spend it in different places. But those things are now being construed as maintenance activities, right. and they're being so they're being they're forced out of the capital plan now. Mm -hmm. But we haven't yet had the opportunity to go ahead and sort of build them into the operating budget. Though so the facilities department on the town side. For the past two fiscal years has, has received the largest right. increases but they've covered more square footage that's right. It, right and it has largely been consumed by utility increases right, right? right. Like you give the department more money but then it gets consumed by things we never get to see the benefit of so we're really trying to you know we were sitting down last week to really undertake what are some of the things we can do to start further curtailing uh utility costs like we we still don't have buildings that have even been retrofitted to LED because we were only doing those projects with green communities funds. Like we weren't building in money into the capital plan to just make those energy efficiency upgrades. And now we're sort of behind the eight ball with some of those things. Right? Like incentives don't even exist sometimes for some of these lighting projects, but that will produce operational savings. So we're trying to identify some of those projects that will provide some operational relief so we can figure right. out a way to fund them moving forward. And I assume if we have to do a transfer, it's it will be because of these facilities, the utility costs. Right. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a cost of it. Um then I have another sort of bigger picture, but not as big as that um question. There's been a lot of rumbling, and tell me if there's a, if there's any chance of it being reified about re-looking at the town rancher for 12 communities and sort of you know forming the committee again and sort of going out and, and rethinking it. Is that Something on your radar screen? Uh, not necessarily. No, okay. No. <laughs> I've heard rumblings around. Uh, other questions? Annie, you made hand up then. No, Charlie. I, I, I would just, uh, in response to this, John's comments, and, uh, my understanding is <clears throat> that the, uh, uh, you know, the, the selectman's commitments when we go for an override are made in good faith. Mm -hmm. But if Dean's uh, Carmen get in comes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which, um, you know, the, the, the town is only bound by the DOR to meet those commitments in the first year. 
right of following the over. And after that, the spending is I don't want to use the term discretionary, but you know, if, if uh, state aid uh, drops by 30 percent, you know, those commitments can be adjusted to make town side or school side uh, operate more efficiently or, or operate at all. But, but they're not they're not cast in stone for, for five years. Agree. And if right, if the money isn't there to support them, that they get, then they don't hold true. That's right. And, and I know the chair of the school committee is aware of that too. Um, John, just one more question. Uh, switching to the capital budgets. Uh, when they were here the other night, uh, I asked this question. So you know, everyone knows that we put aside five percent uh, for capital spending every year. That that's kind of you know uh, policy. It makes perfect sense. The question I raise is, uh, does it always make sense to spend 5% on capital programs every year? In other words, you know, you want to service the debt, but maybe it's the, the, the money that's left over from servicing the debt, you know, right now the policy is just to budget every penny of that. And I would just think that maybe, you know, we put some of that aside, you know, and we actually have start to save some of that up. Uh, has that ever been considered or, and I know Daryl has thoughts on this as well. He's probably grumbling and I'm asking that question. Please, please, don't throw anything at Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that was not our best. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alex, no, there is way more need than money. And, um, you know, I ran into this when I managed the Etsy Capital Program of the state. Not only are there projects that um, you, could do but can't afford. There's projects that we have to do that we can't afford. So if, if you think there's sort of a pot of money that we're saying agencies, here it is going to spend, that's not yeah. how it works. There, the projects that we fund out of cash that you saw on that list are projects that the agencies came to us to ask to have funded. Yeah. So and it's um, a list. It's a list after list that. After that. Yeah, so there's no there's no pressure from us to so like the spend. Full, the full the pressure is from them to like we need the four point nine million that, that gets spent as a current it's, it's basically uh spent in this current year out of the capital planning budget. That's the that, that's the number I was asking about that four point nine million. So it's it's budgeted to be spent this year, right? The checks this year. And I just thought, and again, just raising the question, can some of that four point nine million get put aside and grow? On a year to year basis. And Daryl says, no way. But well, yeah, I just wanted to ask the question again. Theoretically, you could. Yeah. And then there'll be projects that are needed that wouldn't get funded. Because I feel like then, you know, when, when the. They get more expensive. Right. Yeah. If you defer. I think the technical term is kicking the can down the road. Yeah. You, you, you <laughs> lose your opportunity costs, you know, and everything becomes more expensive and more cumbersome and a bigger problem if you avoid. The kinds of things that we address in our capital plan. I mean, so the, the $100,000 items and the $50,000 mm -hmm. items and the 75000 well, Yeah, I mean, it, it, you may be able to pick and choose an individual item. They're like, yeah, maybe you can wait a year on that. But as a as on a macro level, these are things that are needed, that we, have, that we do need, that we're typically behind on purchasing in an ideal scenario. So, so in the, out of the 4.9, you're saying that there's actually like eight or nine that we would like to spend. We, we yeah. Pick the best 4.9 out of well, that's okay. exactly it. It's, we we yeah. prioritize. So, like, how our capital planning works is we we make everyone give us their requests every year, and yeah. it was so high this year in FY twenty five that we made everyone go back and yeah. sharpen their pencil before the capital so, planning committee so, so. looked at them because it was almost twenty million dollars. Where yeah. the request for FY twenty five it was like a shocking number, and so um, it was it just became um, a problematic. The, the need is there. You know, we need this. In an ideal world, we fund all this work in one year, but we just we have to live with that, you know, sort of the constraints of the five percent goal. To Alex's point, this is the first time like where things have come in, where we took a first pass and had to say, "Oh my God, the universe has grown so exponentially. Yeah. This is so much that it would be too vast for capital to even process. Like there would be too many things to even prioritize that we had to go back and say, "No, no, 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 no. Sharpen your pencil. You can wait for that for a few years." Now resubmit and now we'll populate the plan with the requests. So, okay, thank you. And then the amount of money that doesn't get spent out of that free cash and gets turned back the next year is a very small percentage of the, the 
Oh, so I know you were looking at how much has been spent for this year. Yeah. Um, government spending tends not to work in that, yeah. in that linear fashion. Yeah. That you can say, well, you know, we're three quarters of the way through the year. You should have spent three quarters of this money. It really doesn't work like that. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's especially with you know building and so vertical and horizontal construction items and vehicle purchases, right? You could you can order a fire truck now yeah. and, and not see it for a, a year, but that money still sits on deposit, usually the MMDT and is getting you know five percent or whatever it may be. So it still sits in our general fund and, and grows until such time as you know services are rendered or goods are received and then we can actually pay a bill. So with capital there there is oftentimes as Daryl pointed out a lag with actually spending it. So we yeah. we we are collecting some interest in it is growing on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's already but it's just marked. committed and appropriated, but there could be a year until it's spent or potentially two years until it's fully spent based on the nature of the work. All right, last couple of questions, Annie and Al. Okay. I'm gonna do this more lawyer like my question, Jim. Would it be correct to say that when we said when there is like the six and a half percent for special education, three and a quarter for the town budget, five percent for the capital budget. I'm not setting those limiters because we believe that's the amount of money that's needed because that amount of money will create a generous pool of money for us to meet all the needs that anybody could possibly define. We're setting those limiters so that we know that we have our income fairly distributed across those needs and that we are forcing prioritization because we know what our income limitations. Yeah. We're not setting those rules to be generous. No. Right. And, and they are by no means generous, but they are rules that we are to live by because our long range financial plan hinges upon them so that we don't react to individual conditions with specific needs on a year to year basis. So, right. you know, we, we set them and we have them as rules to live by because it provides stability and prevents sort of explosions and expense growth if we were trying to always meet the needs you're right it just causes a rebalancing within that limit each year and as we've talked about my fear is that every time you do that what loses out is the people right so i many years ago had a conversation with then like director who happened to be my sister law about how they handled their capital budget. And it was really clear to me because they hadn't committed to 5% a year. They were underspending on capital. And they had health inspectors driving around with cars that you could see the road through the floor board. So the, the danger here isn't that we spend too much. The danger is that if we don't choose that number correctly so that it forces us to prioritize. Because we don't want to overspend. We don't want people to think there's a big pot out there that they can just draw on. And if we don't set that limit in such a way that it at least funds our needs to a certain extent, we're more likely to go in the opposite direction. And when we go in the opposite direction, we not only have a deferred maintenance problem, an opportunity cost problem, but we can have a health and safety problem. And once we have a health and safety problem, it aggravates our personnel. People will give up a certain amount of salary and benefits in order to work someplace where they feel safe. And they feel respected and they feel like their, their efforts are appreciated and so on and so forth. And there's nothing like feeling like you're driving a safe vehicle or you're using safe equipment to make you feel like the people you work for care about you. Done with soapbox. Did, didn't you go to Charlie's box? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I went Objection. to Charlie's box. Objection. You didn't go to Yes, actually, she was in Alex. Oh, I just wanted to win that argument. I just want to uh, agree with you on the capital needs. And if anybody's going up to the town hall, second floor, uh, Lions Room, you'll, you'll see how much capital needs is none. And that's why I'm really upset with this library article in here, because you could say it's $150,000 to to match what they're going to do. But it's gonna, this thing, if they do what they're planning to do, and they've already decided not to renovate. They decided they want a whole new building. It's going to cost 10, 20 million dollars. Uh, and that's going to have a huge impact on 
what we're able to do capital. And I think I think that library project should have gone through the capital budget. All right. Well, thank you. Yep. I appreciate it. Um, and we'll get back to me um, yep. next week about that. Yep. Yeah. About the last article, and we will follow up with more information once we do finally receive it from our investment firm to pass along. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So let's take some votes on at least um, on Hinge. We either for the articles. Um, article seven, I think we should just let the select board deal with that. Does anyone disagree? Let's go. All right. So let's go to article 54, which is private way revolving fund. Um, so the ask is a hundred thousand. Was there a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on that? All right. All favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, pay access. Um, I moved seven hundred fifty-six thousand three hundred eighteen dollars. Second. I'm sorry. Which article? I just don't take it by. Okay. What is the amount? Well, I'll accept it. I wrote down seven hundred fifty-six dollars, seven hundred fifty-six thousand three hundred eighteen dollars. It's in the, uh, I think that's what's in the old. So, so question, do, do, we, do we need to appropriate the miscellaneous income and the fidelity? I mean, the miscellaneous yeah, no. income, like memberships? No. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the amount was okay. 717 that, Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah. 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 Any questions, discussion? All right, all in favor of Article 25 at 717029, say yes. 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 Any opposed? Abstain. All right, and uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, four, any against? And abstentions. Wait, did you vote, John? Oh, no, I voted yes. Okay. That's yes, 16, yeah. 16, 0, 1. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Article 36, the Parking Benefits District. Does anyone have the numbers? Handy. I have the budget pulled up behind you now. Well, there it is. Is this one of the ones where it's revenues offset by expenses is the way the vote is? Yeah, so we have um, revenue of 422035.20. Um, then we have an offset of one thousand, ten thousand eight. No, don't so. Would be we have administrative costs of ten thousand eight hundred. Parking enforcement is one fourteen one forty eight. Parking meter operation is one three eight five hundred. 
and improvements are 268.760 for a total expense of 532.208. And then a transfer of 11017.80. One one zero. One one zero one seven three point eight oh. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any questions? All right. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Transportation infrastructure, Article 42. Uh, the amount I have is 23615.20. Is that what everyone else has? Yeah. Said 625. 23615.20. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor to say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Um, Article 48. Um, legal defense is zero and identification is $15,161.34. So moved. Second. Yes. Uh, any questions? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same. Same. Raise your hand if you're an affirmative. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen in the affirmative. Any opposed? And one abstention. <laughs> One five one five one point four four. One five one six one point three four. Say that again. One five one six one point three four. All right. Article fifty three. Stratton, um, is there a motion for zero dollars? So moved. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, um, local option taxes, Article 58. Madam Chair. Yep. Move no action on articles uh, on the uh, Oh, I'm sorry. You skip the article. Yeah, on section. local yeah. option taxes. We'll go back to Alan. Uh, I, I think that's going to be the end result, but the legislature is working not only on the tax stuff, but on a whole series of other things that the governor submitted in the uh, act. Um, and I have no idea when these things are coming out. Um, it could be. Uh, that if we just let it stand as uh, no report at this time, and then if by the time the article, it's near the end of the warrant, by the time the article comes up, if there's nothing to do, the chairman could, sorry, chairperson, uh, could get up and simply move no action. But it gives a little more flexibility. How do you feel about that? Is that a motion, Alan? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All right. Any discussion, questions? All right. All in favor of Alan's motion of no report at this time, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, Article 57, the master plan. Um, so 
So the town manager is looking for no money there. So there's no action vote. Um, so I move no action on Article 15. Is that it? Is that so there's fifty thousand dollars right now. Right, but he but he explained that he's oh, not going right. to ask for the fifty thousand. Okay. okay, sorry. Yeah. 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 Does that assume that we're passing the Article 55 if we vote that way, though? Because if we don't pass Article 55, we would have to vote. I think that he's relying on another source of money for the master plan. Right. Okay. Um, and if I, I feel like if if there were if we don't if we don't approve the money for the Fox Library, that frees up that whatever money for the 250th celebration. So, um, so there's a no action motion for 57. It's been seconded. Any other questions on Article 57? On, so we have no action. No action on um, the master plan update, Article 57. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right, we have nine minutes left. Um, is there another article we can discuss in nine minutes? Let me ask a question about sure. one we haven't actually done. With the article 20, which is about the town clerk going to you know, appoint a position, when do we discuss the implications of that? Is that if that passes and it then goes on the ballot and are asked, or do we need to prepare something now? It doesn't require appropriation because so, of that. we weren't going to wait in on we're that. not going to weigh in on it. Okay. I'm Chair. Yes, Chair. <clears throat> I move no action on Article 56. FD prudent investor rule. FD investor rule. I agree. Dean. So I agree with Charlie's recommendation, but can I um can I offer a rationale? like to offer a rationale? The Charlie disagree with the rationale. Oh, we can talk about it. Um I'm not. Um I think it's a I think we're in a cart before the horse moment, right? Um even if you think that they should have an expanded list of um options, you could never no rational person could say that would be okay without an investment. Right, and I guess I understand investment policies can be like annoying because when you have to make it public, people are going to come and you know, come to a meeting, and they're going to be like, "We shouldn't invest in oil companies, and we shouldn't invest in this." And the citizens are annoying, except they pay the bill and they vote, right? Um, but that's tough, tough crap, right? Like they they need a policy before they expand their options. Otherwise, Rebecca said it perfectly. Could you invest in Bitcoin? Yes, but we wouldn't. Based on what? Yeah, why not? So what policy? So that would be my thought. Is I don't think we have up. I don't. I don't think we as a community should have opposition to expanding the list. I think we should have opposition to expanding the list without a policy. That would then have a updated guardrails. And I don't think we should approve the policy. It should be a process. Um, Rebecca, um, thank you. So I am not. I do not feel sufficiently informed to take a position on this yet. Um, but one thing that I would point to people because we only have a few minutes left is that um, I looked up what the actual section three of chapter 203C, section three, and there's a lot more information that I was not previously aware of before this meeting. So I'm planning to read through that more carefully before our next meeting because. It does give some guidelines that would seem to suggest that Bitcoin is not acceptable, and I, I do not currently understand it. So, just putting that out there, there is more information online that I have not found. Um, I think my inclination is with with Charlie, but I was sort of feeling the same way. He had a legal list up there, but we didn't have the legal list. I was I don't think he distributed it to us. No. So I, I'd like to see what the legal list is. Um. I'd like to read the statute um, and a couple other things. Um, you know, we, we just had a few years ago, the, the treasurer lost $500,000 
of stabilization fund money. Uh, and uh, uh, so I move the table. So uh, second. I support that motion. Table or no action. Uh, two motions. The two motions. Okay. So motion. motion for no action and a motion to yeah, table. So okay. Good. Got it. We'll take the motion to table first. Does anyone want to add anything before we take the vote? Well, what's the difference between table and no action? Table A, we'll, we'll, we'll bring it, we'll, we'll come back to this. Oh, there's no action, we're done with it? Yeah. So this will see, think about it, look at the statute, see what other information Jim may be able to provide us. Can you send the link that you found that you're reading to Tara so she can send it to us? Sure. I literally just Googled. Yeah. Two, three, three. Right. Okay. And I got the. Commonwealth of Massachusetts General Court that lists the laws. There may be a better source. So, I, I would just say that even if the law has all sorts of guardrails, it's a no Bitcoin whatsoever, et cetera, we still have the same problem of not having a policy. So, I would argue in favor of no action instead of tabling because I think we're going to end up with no action because we don't have a town policy in place. Can we state that in the comments? For motion. Right. Yeah. But we just finish it with no action. <laughs> Annie? So I have another question, which is okay, is this our article or is it the selectman's article? Or is our vote advisory? The selectman will report, but we can rate in on anything. Okay. So we are recommending no action, but there may be another vote yeah. on this. Which okay. I understand that the board has All right, I think said our, favorable action. I think I think our note on this is going to be really important, and I think that therefore we should be familiar with the statute. So I would be in favor of tabling simply so we can get some more information, so that when we get to the beginning to sound like an inevitable no action vote, we're at least able to say here's the statute we want to see. Um, which, and I and I think saying there's steps we want to see is different from saying, well, no, we read the statute and we concluded we'll never vote for this. So I think that's maybe the reason to do this. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think that the dean said expressed very clearly one of my biggest concerns that we don't have an investment policy. We also don't know what other towns have done and what their experience is with this. Uh, statute, and I don't know, I don't see any reason why for, uh, you know, a $28 million pot there that we need to be out in the front taking whatever risks are associated. And and then the town manager, the different town manager came to us with no historical information on how the current funds perform, uh, whether it is a problem or not a problem. It's all, it's all long waivers. So I, I think there's nothing wrong with saying, let's not do it this year. Let them spend a year working on doing some good analysis and come back with a knowledgeable recommendation. That we did not get a knowledgeable recommendation from. I just point out that there are no other town comparables. The statute is just tax. So there we don't know. No one can point to another town to say, see, we can do this this we well have or this first. course. Well, well, they do have five towns, or a number of towns that Rockland managed. And they don't even know the names of those. Well, yes, we can, we can, we can, we can, we Let or somebody them. can can do an analysis of how we have performed with Rockland under the existing um, situation. But that, but that's another time they're going to be using those same tools. Yes, they're going to be using those same Yeah, and I would favor so tables because, because I think the other group. crucial piece of information is the historical comparison that Jim said the manager said he would get because even even if no other towns do it Rockland may have other funds managed with the same call the same policy they would use that we have some historical performance data. But I think it's another piece of information is if we're going to increase the risk, how much better can we expect it to be? And we got no data. No examples. And I think Rockland should provide that. All right. So we have Alcosti's motion to table. Um, if it fails, then we will go to Charlie's motion. So all in favor of tabling 
this article until we have more information, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve to table. Uh, those opposed, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five opposed. Any abstentions? All right, it is tabled. I will see what um, the town teacher can provide us. And I think that is it for tonight. We have uh, water bodies, the CPA, scenic byways, tourism. In Arlington, do this. Yeah, you know, the committee coming on Monday, which I'd like to finish Human, human Rights Commission and Disability Commission on Monday as well, if we have time, and then pick up these um, articles. And on Wednesday, insurance and water and store, and hopefully finish up all our business at school. Mm -hmm. And I just said we should have a school's budget to distribute. We think we're going to be on the 27th, right? What? We think we're going to be on the 27th? No, we're being on the 25th. Oh, not the 27th. Probably not mm -hmm. the 27th. I was just asked if I could help with candidates tonight, but I wasn't, didn't want to commit. Um, I am hoping the 25th will be our last meeting okay. until sometime in April. Okay. Um, if we need it to finalize any or revoke anything. Okay. But I my, as I've been saying, I hope it is after the 25th. Then we start heavy report writing. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com/acmi to learn how you can help.